described the, the cotton mill village as villages as you remember them right. around Greenville. Okay, Jamie? Okay. I'm Harry Ashmore, and I was born in Greenville, South Carolina, reared there, went to the public schools of Greenville, went to college at Clemson in the next county, over, and worked on the newspapers in Greenville until World War II. And I would, after that, I moved to Charlotte, where I became the editor of the Charlotte News in North Carolina, again in the Piedmont Textile Belt. And Greenville built itself, the Chamber of Commerce built Greenville, as the textile center of the South, and I think that was almost literally the case. I have, in writing about it, reminiscing about it, have said that in some ways it probably represented Henry Grady's idea of the New South as much as any place you could find. Greenville and Spartanburg, which today have practically grown together, uh, that was far and away the most populous part of the state, and it was where all the industry, effectively speaking, that South Carolina had was concentrated in that textile belt. Now that resulted from, for two reasons. One was the Piedmont country was right against the mountains. You could look out any window in Greenville and see the Blue Ridge. The upper end of the county was, was uh, adjoined North Carolina and Tennessee, and it was mountainous. And this was hill country. Piedmont country, the lower end of the county was flattening out to some degree. It had never really been plantation country, although there were some pretty big plantations and farms in the river valleys. Also, it was a place where Buck Duke created the Duke Power Company and harnessed these mountain streams for electricity, which made the cotton mills possible. Uh, the mills had come in there, I suppose, really to use originally water power. Uh, because there were streams, of sizable streams, coming down from the mountains. But by the time I came along, of course, the mills were old. They'd been there quite a long time. They were still moving in. This was a time when there was a great displacement of the textile mills from New England, moving south to take advantage of the climate and the, the proximity to the cotton fields, and also primarily to take advantage of the endless supply of cheap labor. And this was because the farmers, white and black, were being forced off the land. They, this was the time of the great, uh, before there was any soil reclamation. And I can remember the rivers all ran red, the topsoil was all washing away. It hadn't been very well suited for cotton anyway, but they had tried to grow it. And so, literally, these people who were on the land, and this was in the Great Depression, were starving, and uh, so for a generation, they had come into the cotton mills as the cotton mills started. Uh, people writing about the period before my time when these mills were first founded, most of them were founded by local people, and uh, uh, Gerald Johnson has said that it was a, it really was almost a mission. Uh, the South and the end of Reconstruction was in such terrible shape, people were starving that ministers and bankers and other aristocratic folks would band together to start a mill to give them something to work to do. And of course they only gave the work to whites. They didn't, the blacks were absolutely banned from these villages. And the mill villages grew up, I suppose originally out of necessity, built their own housing because there was no place for people to live. In Greenville, because they, I guess the city fathers foresaw what was going to happen. They saw to it that all the mills were outside the city limits, and they refused to expand the city limits to take them in until finally there were probably more people living outside the city limits just around the, at Greenville than there were inside. Population, as I recall, when I was growing up was something like 30,000. But the county was the most populous county in the state. Spartanburg next. Spartanburg was about 25, 30 miles away. So these mill villages dotted the county and they surrounded Greenville. And in the mill villages, the company owned the land, the houses, the streets. They maintained the such public services as were provided. And they had taxing power. Uh, for example, all of the mill villages around Greenville were linked together in a single school district which was jointly maintained by the mill owners. And it was really a pretty good school district called Parker School District. 
But the result of it was, when I was growing up, going to the public schools in Greenville, I had practically no classmates who were what we called scornfully lint heads. And people, proper people who lived inside the city limits, uh, looked down upon these people. They were somewhere a little bit above the level of blacks. But in a way, I think they probably were more scorned. I mean, you'd have some sort of warm relationship on a master-servant basis with blacks who surrounded you. You knew a lot of blacks. You didn't know any lintheads, and you disapproved of them, uh, of their lifestyle, scorned them. They were the rednecks, the lintheads, lintheads as we called them, which is a term of opprobrium, surely. And I recall when I was in grammar school, there was one small cotton mill inside the city limits of Greenville, and it was in the vicinity of where I lived. It was called Camperdown Mill. Just a moment. Chris? Yes, sir. Let's just stop from... Uh, when I was in grammar school, uh, there was one cotton mill inside the city limits of Greenville, and it was not too far. It was in the same area of the city where we lived. The whole city was not very big to begin with. And Camperdown, which was a small mill, but it probably had maybe 50, 100 families who lived in the Cotton Mill Village, which was right adjacent to the Furman University campus, which was then downtown. And so there were five or six kids from Camperdown who were in my school, grade school I went to, and a couple that I recall in my class. Uh, one of them I recall very vividly was a big kid. He was about the biggest kid in the class named Monk Templeton. Uh, I have no idea whatever became of Monk, and I haven't seen him in 70 years or something like that. But Monk became a great friend of mine. I was sort of a smart-ass kid and constantly getting in trouble. Oh, and, I'm sorry. Uh, you better. Okay. okay, roll it. All right, sir. Uh, there was one cotton mill inside the city limits of Greenville, a little mill called Camperdown. I, was, I probably had a, maybe 50 or 100 families who worked there and lived in the village. And that was the only one inside the city limits, and it was in the area of the city that, where the grammar school that I attended was located. So we had four or five lint-head kids in grammar school when I was there, and a couple of them in my class. One that I particularly remember, and remember very, very vividly, was a big kid named Monk Templeton. And Monk and I became friends because I was sort of a smart-ass kid, and I was constantly getting in trouble and frequently getting beat up by other kids. I wasn't very good with my fist, but Monk became my protector, and I think I helped him with his lessons. And he looked after me, and after I took up with Monk, I didn't have any more trouble with the other kids in class because he silenced them. And that's about the only memory I have of him, and I have no idea what happened to him or the others. Do would you ever think, talk about the possibility of going home with him? No, I don't think the question ever came up. Uh, we would play together after I'm sorry, school. sorry, again, uh, about going home with him. That's right. I'd say, no, I don't think I recall ever having gone home with him or taken him home with me. I don't think that was a conscious uh, decision. I think if it had come up, if he'd suggested it, I might well have gone or I wouldn't have thought anything about taking him in my house. But it just didn't come up. We would play after school was out. A uh, bunch of kids would usually get together and sometimes on the school playground or around vacant lots or whatever. Now, these were in the very early grades. I'm talking about the second, third grade. And my memory is not the best of, of any of the circumstances, but I don't recall any social <laughs> interaction. Really, I think this relationship would have been very close to what happened in Southern schools when blacks were admitted. I think it was the same kind of social barrier, unspoken. Nobody said anything about it. I think the kids were treated correctly by the teachers. And uh, I think, if anything, they may have had some uh, help because they needed it. They were clearly uh, inferior in terms of literacy to the rest of us because we had all grown up in households where people spoke correct English and talked to kids. And uh, they came out of a background where the language was countrified and damn near old English in some cases, very different. An accent was quite markedly different. So they were set apart, and I say, I think the situation would Just probably be comparable to what happened. I'm sorry, we'll have to start that again because they're, they're taking yeah. up a little noise in your microphone.
I'm sorry. Okay. You, well, far back you want to go. Just talking about their difference in the difference between yourselves and the and the students. Yeah. Okay. I think it was more like when black kids first came in. So okay. Yeah, okay. Exactly. I say okay. I think probably the distinction would be very close to that that I understand happened. I was far past that age myself, but when blacks were first admitted into the white schools in the South, and there was, there was a distinction made, whether consciously or unconsciously, unspoken in many cases, but they were set apart and they were clearly different, and then the lintheads were that different from us. There were matters of accent, uh, matters of literacy, matters of dress, uh, matters of manner. Uh, I don't think that we were particularly conscious of it, except it was a visible difference. It was an accepted difference. Uh, I don't think anybody belabored it, but uh, it was there. Uh, they had, after all, we, the rest of us, the city kids, had grown up in households where people spoke relatively correct English and where there were literate, where there were books, and where people were, we could all, practically all of us could read and write before we got to school because uh, there was no kindergarten in those days. I think we went to school at age six. And uh, these kids came in, uh, as many black children who come out of the black underclass, they enter school without these communication skills that were natural to us, and that set them apart. So that was a distinction, and as I say, I don't think anybody talked about it much. And I think, again, because you have this sort of tradition of politeness in, in the South, I think we would not have said lithead in the presence of one of these kids any more than we would have been allowed to say nigger in the presence of a black. Uh, it was that kind of uh, manner of question. Um, do you remember later on when you were going out to the, you must have gone out to these villages at some time as, as a newspaper person? Yes, I, I did fairly often in the years after. I, when I got out of college at Clemson, I went to work on the Piedmont, which was the afternoon daily newspaper in Greenville. And they, this was the time of the textile strikes. This was 1937. They were still going on. They had begun in 1934. And everybody was quite conscious of that in Greenville at that time because we had in Greenville County we had really one of the massacres at Honeypath where seven or eight people were, were killed on the picket line. And the National Guard was called out, and I can recall coming home for summer vacation once from college. My older brother worked on a weekly newspaper in Greenville, and he was covering some of this action. And I recall going down to Honeypath with him just to see what was going on. This was after the shooting down there. But the National Guard was in place, and I can recall the machine guns set up at the gate and the guards patrolling and this link fence all along there. I don't recall that there were any pickets out there at that time, but the guard had been put in there, I suppose, after the shooting. And the guard was frequently turned up in these mill villages when there was any kind of disturbance. Now, by the time I came along, the um, strike was the union was still in existence, it was organizing. I don't recall that there was much in the way of active strikes during the 37, there may have been some, but there was a great deal of union activity. And as a reporter, I got to know several of the union people. There was a woman who was in charge of the, uh, the textile union operation in Greenville named Elizabeth Hawes, a very attractive young woman that I pursued a little bit. I wasn't married then. and. Uh, I would take her out and buy her a beer, and I was operating in line of duty. I was trying to get the inside <laughs> information about what the union was doing. She was trying to convert me, and neither one of us were being very successful to the union cause. But uh, she was a Vassar graduate and a very dedicated young woman who had no Southern background, and I'm sure no union background, but she was one of the kind of people like Eleanor Roosevelt who had taken up the cause. And then, visiting Greenville occasionally, and I would interview them, were two of the notable figures in the Union. One of them was uh, Lucy Randolph Mason, who was this FFV lady <laughs> uh, who was an organizer for the Union. And I, was, I always thought it was so wonderful. You could hardly, a deputy sheriff could hardly pick up anybody named Lucy Randolph Mason and slap them in the clink. I mean, Miss Rand Randolph, Miss Mason had sort of 
free passage almost anywhere she went, lending respectability to what was an otherwise unrespectable enterprise. And the other one, was used for the same reason, was a very eloquent Methodist minister named Witherspoon Dodge. And uh, he would come in and preach, and I think even some of the downtown churches would let him have a pulpit occasionally. This chair is sinking on me. <laughs> 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 that one I'm going to sell to Bob Saget. Right. Make okay. sure we haven't pulled this loose. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I saw that. Oh. I it was in her 50s. Yeah. So I guess it yeah. was right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so could you talk about Lucy Mason again then? Yes. Um, some yeah. of the leading figures in the in the uh, the movement, the union mm -hmm. movement, that came to Greenville, and as a young reporter, I interviewed them, and I have two I remember very vividly. Uh, one was Lucy Randolph Mason, Miss Lucy Randolph Mason, who obviously and was every inch an FFV and lent respectability, to, to say the least, to the movement because you couldn't imagine a deputy sheriff picking up somebody named Lucy Randolph Mason who looked like she was always wearing white gloves and throwing her in the clink. So that was one of her great missions, was to uh, say she had to be accepted whether people approved of her or not. She had all the connections. She was a good deal more aristocratic than anybody else in Greenville, I think. Had better old lines to the old South. But the other one was Witherspoon Dodge, who was a Methodist minister and a very eloquent preacher. And he again uh, lent respectability of the cloth to the movement. As I say, I don't recall for sure whether he ever was actually allowed to occupy a pulpit in one of the downtown Methodist churches, but I'm sure he occupied pulpits in the mill villages. Uh, well, maybe he did or didn't because the churches were owned by the management, but they, and, uh, they did have I'm churches. I'm sorry, let's do that again. Uh, talk about uh, Witherspoon Dodge and then the churches being uh, owned by the management. Yeah. All right, sir? Well, another person that I recall was Witherspoon Dodge, who was a very eloquent Methodist minister who worked for the Union and traveled the South. And he came to Greenville occasionally, and I remember interviewing him. And he again, like Lucy Randolph Mason, lent respectability to the movement, a man of the cloth, and obviously a well-educated and really erudite fellow. Uh, I said I can't recall whether any of the downtown Methodist churches ever allowed him to occupy a pulpit. I'm reasonably certain that he probably did a good deal of preaching in the mill villages, which did have churches. And I suppose they had Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian churches would have been the, the usual thing. I doubt that there were any Episcopalians out there, <laughs> certainly no Catholics. But in any case, the churches existed in the mill villages, but they were owned by the management along with everything else, the streets and the houses. So I, whether he act, actually was allowed to preach from a pulpit, I don't know. But he was certainly around, and he was a very impressive and I think a very dedicated man. I had a great respect for him. So the villages uh, were of a pattern. They were, they were really not too bad. They had individual houses. I think probably they all had indoor plumbing, and they had electric lights. Then there was a company store. That was, of course, part of keeping them in peonage. With the, and, and in those days, this was in, and the, the Depression was still going on. And one of the things that would happen to the economy in Greenville and almost paralyze it, the mills would go down to three days and two days a week. And when that happened, of course, the, the hands were only paid about half or less of what they were normally paid. And that meant the retail trade in Greenville, which was heavily dependent. My father was a merchant. He had a shoe store. And so they were heavily dependent on the, the economy was dependent on the, the lint heads to a large extent. So when the mill shut down or, went, or cut back, uh, it really was a, a matter of great moment and the people were quite aware of it. The conditions in the mill villages were, physical conditions were not really too bad. And I think it has to be remembered that the old mills before they were taken over by by national management, which has since happened to over virtually all of them. But the biggest mills around Greenville were still owned and actually operated by old Greenville families. They were sort of the aristocrats of the town. They were the wealthiest people in town. 
there were probably six or seven of those families that I can recall, and I was in school with their children. I knew them, of course, all quite well. And they had started at a time at the end of Reconstruction when the South was really in a plight. Uh, the people were leaving the land, cotton prices had sunk, nobody could make a living on the land anymore. The whites and blacks were being forced into bankruptcy. They were losing the land if they owned it, and they, they couldn't maintain it and they couldn't make a living. So it's a kind of a civic enterprise, as I'm told reading about it. The leading citizens in these towns would get together and form a company and build a cotton mill in part to provide employment for these people. And because the mills had no housing, they, they, whether they intended to make it a company town or not, they did. It may have been in part almost necessary to provide some place for these people to live who were coming right off the farm. That's where they came from. And of course, by the standards of that day, I don't know whether working conditions were really any worse there than they were in the cotton mills in New England, for example. There was child labor, the children worked, the women worked. They used to say you work from can to can. Uh, that's how, the, and, and then one of the issues that the unions would make was the stretch out. Now the stretch out was where they began to put in more efficient machinery and keep the production up, cut the hours back, or made them work longer hours. So at that time, the wages and hours law came in under the New Deal. And one summer before I went to college, only time I ever worked in a cotton mill, I worked at the Union Bleachery, Southern Bleachery, I guess it was. There were two bleacheries. I had a white collar job. I worked in the, the pantograph department. This was a print mill at a bleachery, and it also did print cloth. So they'd make these templates uh, with a, you had copied a, a design, flowers or whatever it was, onto this thing and etched it out. And then that made the roll from which they printed when it went through this, what amounted to a printing press. So I worked in there transferring this stuff. And I recall that that was, it must have been in 1933, I guess. And I think our work week then was 55 hours, 10 hours on a day, five days, and five hours on Saturday. And the wages and hours, the first wages and hours law came in, I think it cut it to 48 hours, something like that. And also raised the pay. I was getting paid on a weekly basis. I've forgotten what it was, but what the first minimum wage was quite low. It was something like 25 cents an hour, maybe. I don't recall. Things were relative. I mean, it was, uh, it was still a substantial increase. And I, that's my only experience. I worked there, I guess, about two months in the summer and then went off to college. Never had any desire to go back to work. Now I had the best end of the of the workplace. I got I got the job because my brother, who had just gotten out of college, he'd gone to Clemson. He was a textile chemist, and he was working there in the managerial experimental laboratory mm -hmm. part of the place, mixing ink or whatever. He lasted about six months. And he decided that was not for him. <laughs> and, so there was no air conditioning in these places, and you can believe me, in the summer it was hot. You sit there with the sweat running off of you. But I say I was in the white collar section of the cotton mill. I wasn't really in with the loom fixers and the, the fellows where they're really hard labor. Talk about the loom fixers squat, where you had to squat down and work on the bottom of the loom, spinning and weaving. Um, I say, I don't, that certainly it was a hard existence and a low paid existence, but it probably was better than what they had on the farm mm -hmm. that that came from. Could I ask you something now? Yeah. You mentioned that the merchants were so beholden to the, to the cotton mill workers for their, their yeah. trade. And yet it seems to me that the Chamber of Commerce were very much against the unions which were trying to raise those wages, could you talk about that? Oh yes, the Chamber of Commerce were, were, I think without exception, reactionary. They were opposed because the owners were opposed and the owners dominated the economy. The Greenville News, where I worked, it had actually been owned by one of the mill barons at that, and had sold it to the man who owned it when I was there, named Roger Peace, uh, Boney Peace, his father, the old man, who had been a printer. <laughs> 
And for public relations reasons, Captain Smythe, who owned the paper, decided he'd better unload it. I mean, they were getting so much criticism. This was back, I think, in the early 20s. And apparently some reaction. I don't think there was much of a union movement then. But in any case, he sold it to this commercial printer who became the publisher. And it's now very, the family is extremely wealthy now because it's become a chain. It's now Metro Media or something like that. I've forgotten what it's called. But in any case, that's an indication. I mean, they, they dominated the, the media. And the news and the Piedmont, when I was there, I have no idea if it had an editorial position it would have been in favor of management. Uh, I wasn't on any instructions to slant the news particularly, but we didn't cover it with a great deal of depth. I would think it would, I would interview these people if they were fairly prominent when they came to town. And I reported it straight, and as far as I know, it wasn't slanted. But certainly there was little, if any, support for the Union outside of the Cottonville villages. And the hostility was certainly there. Uh, it was not, and it's strange, I guess it's a particularly Southern characteristic. The main uh, uh, instrument for discrediting the Union was to keep them from being respectable. <laughs> You see, it was not respectable to support the Union. This was, uh, this was beyond the pale. It was like the same thing about race. You could be very fond of blacks, and you could, uh, you could have blacks that you were very intimate with as long as it was a master-servant basis. But it was not respectable to, to socialize with them in any way, and the, the cotton mills were the same way. And I think it was that, that aspect of it that it had as much to do with the, with the hostility. Now, actually, the the economic interest of the community would, should have been identified with the union. It wasn't so much that these people were frequent customers, but they had enough money in circulation so that when their money dried up, then the whole economy went down. And also, the fact that they were out there working at uh, the very low wages that prevailed kept wages down throughout the city, even